Hello and welcome to another edition of the Marketplace Sellers Podcast with me, Alec Ogilvie. Now, as you may know, at the Marketplace Sellers Podcast, we talk about how to sell online, especially on places like Amazon and eBay. Uh, and if you like what we do, then please share, like, subscribe and follow. In fact, why not give us a review on iTunes, leave us five stars, and that will encourage us to do more of these and to keep passing on useful stuff to yourself. Please feed my ego with a five-star review. It's really not as big as my ego needs to be. So um, what are we going to do in this episode? Well, in this episode, we're going to broaden things out from the marketplace world. And I'm delighted to say that to help me do that and to share his experience of the online world is Greg Kane of Hue and Cry. Greg, welcome to the show. How are you doing, Alex? I'm good. I'm good. How's mm-hmm. yourself? I'm very good. Just when you mentioned five-star reviews, we were doing a gig in a wonderful place called Torrey in Aberdeen last weekend, right on the coast, uh-huh. just right at the harbour. And um, our trumpet player had just done a gig with the Scottish National Jazz Orchestra, and he got three five-star reviews. Fantastic. So, I know, I've, I've, and I've never met anybody that's had three five-star <laughs> reviews. So Tom McNiven, the trumpet player, is a three times five-star reviewer. So. Um. So that makes him a 15-star trumpet player. You have to give him well, more eyes. Well, um, you can imagine. He, all he does is complain about how little I pay him. But anyway, <laughs> yeah, now I've met a three times five-star reviewer. But um, no, this is. I'm glad you've asked me to do this. This is great. I'm looking forward to it. Totally good. Totally good. Now, many listeners uh, of this are more interested in things e-commerce. Mm-hmm. So um, I'm sure a lot of the people listening in know exactly who you are. Yeah. Um, but... Why not take us back to those early days when you first broke through with Hugh and Cry? How did Hugh and Cry come about? Well, as you know, Hugh and Cry are two brothers. So um, Pat and I were raised together um, with another brother, a younger brother. I'm the middle one. He's the oldest. And I've got another brother, Guy John, who's the youngest. Um, And my father was a big music lover. My mother was a great dancer. Um, So she had the sense of rhythm and he had the the, uh, crooning voice. So they were always... We were classic growing up in the, the 60s and 70s. Everybody seemed to be skint back then, but twice as happy. I don't know how that works. <laughs> so there was lots of nights of no money. What do you do? You dance and you sing amongst family and friends. And these big family gatherings were, I guess, the first stages that Pat and I would perform in. I, was, I went to piano lessons from the age of eight, nine years old. So when these family gatherings would happen, Pat would sing and I would play the piano and Every year we upped our repertoire to the point where Pat and I were mostly playing the whole night and I had to learn my drunken uncle Desmond and my drunken uncle, uh, what's his name, James, the songs that they wanted to sing as well, so I had to learn them. So from a very early age, in, in those sort of very intimate family gatherings, you le- you sort of learned your craft. Very good. I mean, I, I guess uh, those big family gatherings can make a difference. I mean, certainly I remember being forced to sing and there was always one singer, one song. Yeah, I mean, it's the one singer, one song. It's part of the Scottish culture, isn't it? And I mean, I think at the time you were, there was no um, option of opting out. You had no. to do it. And even the cousins that couldn't sing had to do something. So there was, I remember the first time I heard the, the poem um, about the, the worm, we fat, squishy ones, do you hear the wiggle and squirm? My poor <laughs> cousin who couldn't sing a note used to do his, his worm poems every year <laughs> so i mean and then the girls used to do the dance and whatever ballet dancing they'd learn so i mean it was always i mean i don't know if that was every family situation but when i talk about i mean i answer this question many times over my career it seems to be quite a constant that runs through a lot of people's memories at their age people in their kind of early 50s to early 60s it seems to be a kind of thing that we grew up with yeah no i remember that well my grand's my, my uncle colin his favorite piece was i'm nobody's child which um <laughs> <laughs> not the cheeriest thing to be singing a yeah, family was, get there, together there was a lot of misery in these evenings <laughs> <laughs> there was lots of men crying into their whiskies i remember that. <laughs> so you might have been happier but by gum we sang miserable uh, tunes but i mean so that's how pat and i started realizing that we had a love and a, and a um, symbiotic love of music and um, one thing led to another, and we were at school together. Uh, I was playing saxophone in a band, and the singer left, um, and we didn't have a singer, and I said, my brother can sing. And part of the reputation at school, he was the ducks of the school every year, so he wasn't the most popular guy because he was so smart. So when they asked, and, and I suggested my brother, their eyes rolled and went, no, not him. But when they heard him sing, and he's a great lyricist, Pat, and he, we wrote some songs for that band, um, it was it did quite well. They were called the Winning Losers. The Winning Losers. The Winning Losers. And um, 
but they threw us out the band because Pat and I started to write most of the songs. Ah, right. So that, that would have been in 82, 83. And then Wine Forward, four years later, Labour Love was in top 10 all around the country and all around Europe. And Pat and I were touring with Madonna and U2. And I. Maybe shouldn't, have thrown, maybe shouldn't have thrown us out of the band, but <laughs> I still got on well with them. Musical so. differences. Uh, well, no, I, yeah, I, I just, Pat and I were quite dominant. And, and, and when you're in the entertainment industry and you're in the music industry, you have to have a certain assurance to succeed. Uh, you can be all meek and mild in the, the, in the outside if you want people to see you like that, but you've got to be pretty hard-headed and you've got to be very committed. And sometimes when people get in the way, they get pushed aside and that's just the way the music business is. You have to, you have, you've got to have that sort of metal to you to survive in this business. And was it always going to be a music career that you were aiming for, or was there other things on the on the agenda? No, I went to um, Napier University to study energy engineering, which was uh, alternatives to fossil fuels and nuclear fuels. So we were studying studying wind, wave, and solar. A lot of the people that I went to university with all end graduated and ended up with fantastic jobs in the most luxurious and uh, glamorous locations all around the world. So that was that's what I wanted. I always wanted to be an engineer. And uh, I remember sitting in physics one day in school and the physics teacher said, did you know that the internal combustion engine is only 22% efficient? And I would think, what? 22%? Mm. Where does the other efficiency go? And that's what got me into the kind of engineering and the whole kind of um, efficiency and then into renewables and into uh, alternative uh, sources of energy. That got me hooked on that just from that simple day. The day that that physics teacher said it's only 22% efficient and it just I couldn't get out of my head. And I had to figure out why. So that sent me down that path and I had got my A-level maths, my A-level physics and I just got really into it. And then when I went to university, really enjoying the course, um, a publishing company, Warner Chapels, one of the biggest publishing companies, approached us and wanted to sign us as songwriters. And I was just about to start my second year at university. Pat already graduated from Glasgow Uni. Um, and we looked at each other and thought, when are you going to get this chance again? And my principal at university said, don't leave, just finish, get your degree, get your degree. But I said, I'm never going to, never know if this chance is going to happen again. So we took the chance. Um, and that was in 1984. So but it obviously paid off, but it must have been a huge step. I mean, presumably your family were more than nervous about you yes, kind of quitting ever so, ever so slightly. Um, but my, my um, the great thing about it, they said you can always go back. So I've still got, I've still got three years <laughs> in the bank somewhere. So and look, always... I mean, I, I think a degree in energy and wind power is going to be pretty useful these days. It seems to be where we're all heading. Well, my friends that have graduated that I've found them again via the social media sites, uh, they've all done incredibly well. I mean, most of them ended up in WAVE, which is very interesting. So right. because of maybe it was in Edinburgh, the university, um, our main lecturer was one of the main guys for the WAVE, the mm -hmm. kind of research into WAVE power and the Firth of Forth and all that kind of stuff. So a lot of them followed him. And I don't know where he is now. I think he might be, I think they're in Australia. I think most of them, but uh, yes. But the, the slightly sinister thing about it is our course was funded by BP Oil. <laughs> <laughs> and anything that we discovered, they had, right. the, pat they had the patent on. Wow. Yes. Right. It's the classic thing where, um, I mean, there has been rumours that they suppressed a lot of the technology, especially the electric battery technology. I mean, that... Um, there's loads of these, these documentaries about the, is it the EV20, I can't remember, it was the General Motors electric vehicle that they right. released them all out to um, the celebrities in the, the 80s in, in Los Angeles and they realised that they're the best cars you could buy and they would go on forever and they recalled them all because oil companies had lobbied them and said, look, get, get these things off the road because if anybody, if anybody copies this technology, we are gubbed. Right. So, I mean, there was a lot, this was back in the 80s, so, I mean, the, at the stage now, I mean, my social media feeds flag up with last week Scotland had a, produced 136% of its energy from renewables. It keeps flashing up, and I think it's sitting about 50%, 60% of our energy uh, we're, we're getting from renewables, which is unbelievable. I know, right? Certainly, That's certainly when I saw the windmills going up round about us, I thought, is this really going to work, or are they just a simple blot in the landscape? So mm -hmm. um, I might be having to eat my words a wee bit. Well, but interesting that, that BP wanted to hang on to any, any intellectual property, and I guess that's the same in the music industry. Quite difficult to hang on to your rights as a musician. Um, there's a lot of protection in um, 
in the music industry and uh, with, as far as your rights are concerned, just never sign an in perpetuity contract. Just never sign them. You can sign yeah. terms. A lot of our terms were like 20 years, uh, right. but never sign in perpetuity and for the universe. That's the one you used to always see. We will sign you for the universe and in perpetuity. Never sign that contract. <laughs> but it's dead easy. So you owe me forever for the entire universe. Yes. No, no, no. I'm not going to sign that. So as long and, as you don't and, sign and, contracts uh, like that, you're fine. And and who did sign the band? Because uh, Richard Branson. So wow. Via has, um, he did a thing when he set up Virgin Records, he set up what was called AVL, which is the Associated Virgin Labels. So there was a whole load of smaller record companies, little satellite entities that the mothership was Virgin Records. So we signed to one of them called Sucker, but ultimately it was Virgin Records. But Sucker had Hue and Cry, Nana Cherry, Massive Attack. They were the three main bands that Sucker had. Um, and then Branson in 80, let me get this right, oh, 1990, 90, sold the whole thing for $650 million to buy airplanes. So he right. sold the whole thing to EMI, and then when EMI had a look at us, they went, nah. <laughs> <laughs> and they did that to a whole load of people. So in 1990, we had a great manager um, who saw all this coming. So he said to us, make as much music as you can, as fast as you can because we don't know how long this train's going to keep running. And he was right. So we made, our first three albums were released in three years. So Seuss and Abandoned, Remote, and uh, Stars Crash Down were released year, year after year. So we worked really hard for those first three years, and we built a solid foundation that's lasted as, you know, 30-odd years till now. That's like 30 years ago. So that manager was right. He just said, you know, while the iron's hot, Let's keep going, let's keep going. And sure enough, once EMI bought Virgin, they culled half of the register. It was just like... Was. Uh, it so was, how, how did it feel during that three years? It must, I mean, it must have been flat out. Did you feel like a cog in the machine or, or did you still feel in control? How did you actually react to that? No, I was very young. So in 87, I was only 21. So at the time, you're just getting swept along. You're trying to... I'm not really a big um, drinker. I'm not a drug user. So as long as you stay away from the booze, and stay away from the drugs, and just try and keep yourself reasonably fit. Your stamina is there at 21 years old. You can rule the world at 21 years old. <laughs> so you just keep going, and um, things presented themselves to us every day. I remember one week being in London, and on the Thursday, we're doing something on the Tuesday. We were on Pebble Mill at one on the Tuesday, and on the Thursday we are on Top of the Pops, and then the Saturday we were on Wogan in one week. Mm -hmm. like back then, you're talking millions upon millions of people being um, able to see you on the TV. So there'll be a week like that, and then the next week you'll be on Concord flying to New York to do shows with Madonna or with James Brown. And it was just loads of stuff like that. I mean, it sounds really glamorous. It probably was really glamorous. But all you knew was, uh, at 21 years old, it's just you to uh, play good look as good as you could and try not to put your foot in it when you're being interviewed. So you're constantly concentrating. And at 21 years old, you just want to go nuts and have fun. Yeah. But there was no time to go nuts and have fun. Right. Yeah, that's I, think that's just, I think that's the Scottish thing coming out in you, though, that you don't have fun. <clears throat> well, no, I, I mean, I'm trying to think. I had my most fun when I'm my, my mid to late 20s. That's when I had loads of fun. But when I was the height of the kind of success of Hue and Cry, I mean, Pat and I lived out of each other's pockets for nearly five years. I wasn't home one time for about 18 months. Goodness. Because we were away. So um, you lost friends, you lost um, partners, you lost contact with your family quite a lot. So, yeah, Pat and I committed to it. We definitely did commit to it. And as I said, that's what's laid the foundations for us to have built this 30-year yeah. career. And the marketing at that time, was it, I mean, presumably it was Virgin and Richard Branson's machine that was doing the marketing. <coughs> did you have much say in that or, or was it? them that whistled it along? Um, you had a say in it where there's a lot of the times where you wouldn't do stuff. I mean, right. I remember they would ask us to do TV shows that we didn't particularly like the presenters, James Whale being one of them. And then right. um, I remember Terry Christian being another. Um, and who else? was There was a few ones they would say, no, we won't do that. Uh, but it was mostly um, the marketing stuff. As long as... The, the marketing people have to be careful because if you put an artist in a situation where they're going to feel slightly compromised or slightly, not out of their depth, but in the wrong place, they're going to react and they're going to be quite aggressive. There right. were some classic moments of Paul Weller on Saturday morning TV, and it's the most hilarious you've ever seen. He's sitting there and you can see him going, what the hell am I doing here? 
and you're trying to sell records, Paul, but these people don't want to buy my records. I'm not selling records to 12-year-old kids. But at that time, the biggest outlet for music promotion was Saturday morning TV. Now, Saturday morning TV is completely different now. It's all cook. It's all food. Food yeah. destroyed the music industry. But back in, <laughs> back in the day, in the late 80s and early 90s, Saturday morning was for music. It was all about music. Um, and it was a very strange, because these kids were all, Saturday morning TV was like 11 to 12 year olds. You know, Pat and I are singing songs about working class Tories and trying to understand them. We're singing songs about the stereotypes of the, the kind of heterosexual testosterone man and I refuse. Singing about um, domestic violence and looking for Linda. And this wee 12 year old kid's sitting going, la 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 la. You think, this is just too weird. Uh, See, then, all I remember from Saturday mornings when in that <clears throat> period was recovering from a hangover watching Sally James on Tiz Was. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> but there would, there would have been about uh, three or four musical uh, acts on Tiz Was on a Saturday morning. Number 73 we used to do quite a lot. And then um, right. there was CD UK. Do you remember that? CD UK. Aye, I do. Aye, that was a good programme. Music was, um, I mean, it's omnipresent now, but back then uh, it was really important for viewing figures and really important for the broadcasters, and that's completely flipped on its head now. Yeah, uh, it certainly has. So, yeah. and if we come to the present day, I mean, I know you're spending a lot of time in your recording studio in Glasgow. Mm -hmm. uh, how did you get to this position? What, what is it you're currently doing now? Is that recording studio just for Hue and Cry? Uh, how do you use it? Well, um, Pat and I have always needed a place to, to work. We've had many different sort of places that we've worked in, but um, we're in a beautiful place called the Mary Hill Borough Halls now in Glasgow up at Mary Hill. Beautiful old gathering hall and um, fire station it was initially. that had a £10 million refit and they built two recording studios in the place. So fortunately, Pat and I got one of them. So it's our personal space that we use, but I'd say over the space of a year, I maybe have another six or seven clients that can vary from audio restoration to video editing to um what's the thing i'm putting together now lots of av for ceremonies i right. kind of got my head i got my head into after effects i really love after effects and the only thing about using after effects is you need to keep buying more powerful computers every year which kind of defeats <laughs> the purpose of it but um yeah so at the moment i'm working on the av uh, for the S scottish album of the year award ceremony which happens at Paisley Town Hall in June. So all the AV is about 50 minutes of audio visual you've put together for a, a two-hour show that has to be triggered via QLab and all. So I get I got into all that sort of complex AV, which I really enjoy. So other than you and Cry, that's the sort of stuff that I do. Right. So, I mean, I guess very much in the kind of, well, certainly the kind of marketing space as well, if you're doing video work. Um, yeah. So, so very much kind of using the online tools as well to make sure this stuff can get out there. Yeah, I've always I've always kept uh, I've always kept up to date with what's going on with the kind of marketing side. I noticed one the other day, Alex it was very funny. If a video comes up on your uh, Facebook feed and you can't the the visuals come up, but you can't hear the audio, what they've done is they've put a little sign in the top left hand corner that says "click to unmute audio." Mm -hmm. Now that's a complete lie. It's just a little bit of graphics that's on the actual video. And the video's got no audio. So when you click it, that's you clicking on the video to take you to the... Ah, right. <laughs> I was so so, going, so just clickbait. Click, just clickbait. But it's like, so the, the video comes up. I know you can kind of like, well, why can't I hear that? And you just click this. I mean, it's, just, it's not even an active button. It's just a graphic yeah. on the top of the video that says unmute, unmute audio. A total scam. I thought that's quite a good one. So, I mean, I used to always keep up to date with <laughs> these things. Um, but I said, with Hue and Cry, uh, we came back, 2006, we came back, we did a Saturday night TV show and it did really well for us. And uh, there was about 160,000 people all over Britain voted for us to get through to this next round of old 80 stars that can still sing.com. I can't remember what it was called. But we, we realised there's 160,000 people that had phoned in and actually voted for us. Mm -hmm. So at that point, um, record companies and management companies get interested because there's a marketplace right there. Yeah. So because of that, we came away from that show thinking, right, Pat and I weren't really, we were maybe doing 10, 15 gigs a year. I was working with the Scottish National Jazz Orchestra, doing a lot of other recordings. Hugh and Cry wasn't really at the forefront for Pat and I. But because of this show, because of the amount of people that phoned and voted for us, we said, right, let's find out about this. Let's go and find where these people are. So very interestingly, Every venue in Britain keeps a list of people that have bought tickets. 
mm-hmm. you can access it. We didn't know this. We just found it out by asking promoters. So we phoned around all the venues we had and said, have you digitized, digitized this? Remember, this is 2006, and yeah. some of them had. So before long, within about, I don't know, must have been about two or three months, we'd found about 20,000 of these people that we thought would have phoned for us, but we found 20,000 uh, email addresses through these venues that people had come to see Hugh and Cry. Right. This is all pre-Facebook. This is all pre-social mm-hmm. media. So we used the Ning platform to build our own social media network, which was a, a walled garden. So you had to sign in, um, but it wasn't it wasn't open to the... You had to sign in. We had to approve you before you got in. And what happened then was you were in this walled garden and we encouraged you to scan in your old tickets, scan in the old albums or the old cassettes that you bought, talk about them. We listed the history of all the gigs we'd ever done. And if you found that gig, you could post up your memories of it or any photographs you had of it. So we started building this social network uh, for Hue and Cry fans. And in the space of many years, we just stopped doing it about a year ago because the Nine platform just wasn't right for us anymore. Everybody was, everybody migrated to Facebook anyway. Yeah. So the Nine platform, we ran it for, oh God, that must have been eight years. And then at the end of the eight years, we had about 50,000 people that were on that social network that just, and we serviced it. I did video contents. I broke down, well, they asked us to do an explanation of songs. Pat and I would set up a video camera, do an explanation of the songs and post it up. It was all fan-led. They would put together set lists for us when we'd go on tour. We'd crowdsource what set list they wanted. So Pat and I were active. On a Friday night, Pat and I would do a live chat. Every Friday night, we'd rotate it. Right. So on Friday night, they could come, uh, and it was so, I used to do it from the pub sometimes, I used to be sitting in the pub in the pals <laughs> and say, right, do you mind if I put this on? And the who is that? Craig, there's about 500 people on this. I said, I know, it's a bit of a nightmare. So it was all like streaming, and you were just trying to stay in contact. So Pat and I put a shift in to build this social network, and the gigs got busier, the albums sold more. At that time, Prince and Sting and a lot of these other bands were charging 150 quid a year for this sort of service. But we were doing it for free. I just we had long and many long conversations about the paywall, um, and I said you can't pay, for, you can't make people pay for this. It's just you're talking about building your tribe, and ideally, what you want it to do is you want it to become um, self-sufficient, so you don't have to keep leading and have to keep coming up with ideas for people to engage with each other. And that's what happened to a certain extent. Well, the fans were getting together. Um, they realised if they all got together and were coming to one gig, they could get cheaper hotel rooms because if it was 20 bookings, they would get a cheaper rate. Right. And it's now got to the stage where there's little tribes of them within the Hue and Cry uh, fan clubs that they all get together and they book 20, 30 rooms. That's and fantastic. one guy one guy or one girl books it and it gets them a cheaper rate. So they've already, this is eight years, eight years ago we started this, maybe a bit more actually. It is more, it's 11 years ago we started this. I think it was 2017, Alex. Um, <laughs> aye, so... We've been through all that journey, and with the advent of Facebook, it's all moved to Facebook now. Um, yeah, but you'll be old hands now at being able to do this, because you've learned the techniques on Nine, mm-hmm. you, you rebuilt that tribe that were fans of you in the 80s, yep. and, and now you're, well, you're connected to them on a daily basis, and like you say, you're, you're able to, well, drive a business through the back of that online world. That's, I mean, a, quite a remarkable story to, to engage every Friday night, even from the pub, talking to your fans. Yes, and then it, it's um, at the stage you are now, uh, no, nobody buys CDs anymore. We still produce CDs, but nobody buys them. This, uh, what happens is you're doing all this stuff for free. There's a, there's a heavy workload. I mean, there's a lot of times I was close to breaking down where I'm looking at my manager, I'm looking at my brother and Pat saying, look, guys, you need to help me out here. I'm doing, like, it felt like 10 days a week video editing. and. Yeah. For the sake of having to give this video away for free, uh, but we're selling more tickets, selling more tickets. My manager would say that. I said, yeah, but you're not the one sitting video editing for 14 hours a day. So mm. there, there was a high level of workload. And and it seemed, in, in the early, t- early days, it was frustrating because there's a lot of shouting in the emptiness. You know, is anybody engaging yeah. with this? Is anybody, you know... And I've I've met a lot of people that have spoke to me about trying to set up online businesses and YouTube channels and stuff like that. It's not easy, Alex. And in a way, because we started it before Nink, before Facebook on the yep. Nink platform, it was probably lucky and beneficial for us because there was nowhere else for people to go. 
-hmm. And the cost of building an app, I mean, I remember going to meet these digital companies and it's like, we'll build you an app for 15 grand, we'll build you an app for 25 grand. You're like, really? What's this app going to do? Well, it's going to do this, going to do that. This is all, basically Facebook does 10 times what this app we've ever done. So, mm -hmm. I mean, thank goodness we never went that route. And one of the reasons we were forced to go, not forced, but we're, we're drawn to the Ning platform was it was for free. Yep. So a lot of these guys was these web designers. I mean, I don't begrudge these web designers. Some of them are amazing. And if you've got that kind of budget, I would pay 15, 25 grand for these designers to build you up. <coughs> but we didn't have that kind of budget. So we went to Ning. You were getting a lot of the facilities and and the um, ideas and the opportunities you were getting through the app. You were getting for nothing via the Ning platform, which has now become morphed into Facebook, which is Ning was what Facebook is now. Right. So, but who's who's building who in cry.com? Who, who runs that? Who actually looks after that for you? Is it yourself or, or do you have a team that looks after that for you? Well, after the um, we came back in 2006, I was working with a quite a successful music manager um, and he was he was fronting the deals for Pat and I, the TV deals we were doing and the gig deals and he was taking a 20% commission. But he was making, he was giving his, he was getting his great deals. So he approached us and said, look, would you be up for sp splitting the company three ways between me, you and Pat? I'll put some capital into the company, which is a six-figure sum of capital. You can decide what we want to do with that capital. You can stick it in your pocket. You can leave it in the company, blah, blah, blah. And let me earn a third of what Hugh and Cry uh, makes. And we thought, well, that sounds quite exciting. And then we worked out the numbers and thought, right, okay, uh, We'll do it for a term. We'll do it for 20 years and see how we get on. He's like, fine. Now, my manager's a pure capitalist. He's not interested in jazz or design. or <laughs> In fact, no, that's not true. He's a good photographer. But um, he likes making money, whereas Pat and I were never very good at making money. We kind of seemed to make enough to get by. But since we committed to him and the company's been split three ways, it's been our own success with Alex. And it's all that thing about when young bands came to me, and say, this manager's approached me and, and she wants to take 20% of my earnings for X amount of time. And I said, why do you offer 25%? What? I said, well, you need to give her an incentive. You need, every band needs another person and you need to give that other person incentive to work for you. Mm -hmm. So this was how Hugh and Cry is structured now. So Doogie, my manager, his office, there's about um, six people in the office and they manage other bands like Wet 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 and Dread Sky July and they've got one of big uh, tour travel company that does nothing but rock and roll tours, tours like for the Eagles and for Barbara Streisand, Oasis, like they're kind of quite high end. So the girl in our office, Emma, she's in charge of our social media and um, she reaches out to Pat and I uh, to give her the content. We give her the content. She decides when she wants to post it up and what she wants to do with it. So right. that's the way it's structured now. Yeah, I did wonder about that because um, obviously – Facebook's a busy place for guys like you to inhabit, so I did wonder yeah. who would be actually helping with that type of stuff. So yeah, when it comes to, to things like merchandise, is, is that your management team as well? Are they, yep. are they suggesting what merchandise is up there? Yep, that's exactly what we do. And what's happening now is um, we do deluxe versions of our albums. So these mm -hmm. deluxe versions, the one I'm putting together for a new album, Pocket Full of Stones, which is out in the beginning of September, at the moment I'm editing together the making of that video um, the making of the album sort of DVD so if you go you can buy the album you can listen to it in Spotify for nothing for your 10 quid a month you can buy it for a tenner from the website or you can buy it from a tenner when you come to see us or you can spend 40, 50, 60 quid we've not really priced what it is yet on the deluxe version of the album and you've got all this extra content mm -hmm. what we've found is the thousand plus fans the super fans uh, they'll buy that yeah, and they'll buy it every time we release it um, there's a there's a splurge of about five six hundred that will buy it pre order, and then it takes us about another six months of touring and working to sell the other ones. But we only ever make a thousand of them. Now um, we are the profit on that is about sixty percent profit for us. Right. So what you can do is that's where you make your money now. So you're kind of surrendering your recordings to Spotify and Amazon Unlimited Music or. Uh, iTunes, where you don't get much money when it's streaming, but what you do get in these deluxe boxes, and we've been doing this for a while, it's just something that a manager loves, he loves you get these like really ornate versions of 50 years of Elvis or 
the ultimate who book and it's these things cost like five or six hundred quid he's got loads of them in his office he just loves them and they're great to thumb through so ours that's what he likes to do and he's found companies uh, i think there's one in italy and one in wales that they just send you templates different templates of these deluxe boxes and they'll, they'll put them together for it you send them all the uh, assets and all the content and they'll put it together and our, the Hugh and Cry fans absolutely love these things um, so as part of our, our way of making money now is these ultimate collecting, collection boxes of the, the, the different albums that we've made Yeah I read about that a couple of weeks ago with the the, uh, the new album and um, <clears throat> it's going to include a pebble from a beach, is that right? Yes, I've been walking in the beaches wherever did we go? We up to, it was um, down by Largs, we went, no down by Green, down the water, down at Greenock and Guruk, and uh, yes, Pat and I have been stooped picking up these stones. But see this beautiful thing about stones, Alex? Uh, Pat and I didn't know that we both had a love of stones. Now, <laughs> it's something that would never really come up in conversation. You know, I said, do, no. you, do you like stones? I. <laughs> but when you think about it, you're holding like hundreds of millions of years of evolution in your palm of your hand. You know, stones, I don't want to get too heavy into it, but the album's <laughs> called pocket full of stones and if you hold a beautiful stone and you look at how it's formed and the, the, the different hues and the different pigments and the different um, discolorations on it and the smoothness of it over millions of years of that existence you hold it in the palm of your hand Pat and I are big stones fans so we've been <laughs> on beaches and we picked up a thousand of them very good. And I mean, not I guess, I, not, I guess in one, not in one trip. I can. No, no, I was going to say that's that's quite a lot of stones to be picking up. You'd probably right. get lifted by the local police. Um, <laughs> we but, use many different beaches. <laughs> <laughs> I hope it's a sustainable resource. I, I think so. I don't but think I guess, it. But I guess for the fans, that's um, it's quite personal. I mean, because they know that you um, have actually picked these things up, and you've decided that that is a stone that you want to pass on. So, I guess, I guess for your super fans, that must be quite a wee, a nice wee gift. Well, you would hope so. I mean, the the, the boxes are lovingly put together, and we get so much um, affection from the, as I say, the thousand or so super fans that buy these boxes every few years. We we, we put them out. But I listen to a lot of modern um, music podcasts about modern music industry, and. This this model is becoming the de facto now, right. whereas this is where you're making the money. Your your margin sixty percent, uh, and if you can sell a thousand of them, and you know if you can depends. We've had them priced at hundred quid, we've had them priced at forty quid, and it's somewhere in between there, depending, you know, what's in the box and what you think you, you can you can sell it for. But if the markup sixty percent, you're making profit on your records. I mean, we don't we don't go to a studio anymore, and you think, right, I've only got fifty thousand pounds to spend on my album. We don't do that. Recording Hue and Cry is like an ongoing expense. It's not you can't how much should pocket full of stones the album cost you. Well, we, that's not the way we think about it. Once we get it finished, then there's usually four months lead time for the promo people and the press people and TV people and the radio people to get on board and try and sell it then it's just an ongoing, evolving sort of promo schedule. Once this thing's been promoted and toured, Pat and I have already started writing the next record and off it goes again. So it's, it's a different way of doing it, but um, these deluxe boxes are, listening to these podcasts that I listen to, it's, it's the de facto way of making money now. If you can, if you can get a thousand fans that will buy these things and you're not flogging them crap, Alex. It, it, it takes a lot of time and effort to build the content that's engaging to be in these boxes. But if you design it well enough and you get the right people to make it for you, um, you can profit from it. And it's now become a, quite a big part of our uh, income. Yeah, I get that loud and clear. I mean, I think I think any anything that you can get that is a unique little item, you know, you know, a small object of desire, like something yes. that you have put together, I think that's really special. And people will spend the 40, 50, 60 quid to get that because there's only a few of them in, the, in existence. Yeah, well, and I guess, still, yeah. Sorry, it's still the scarcity model. I mean, the scarcity yeah. model for the music business is out the window. It's all about access. You have to give people access, as easy access to your music as you possibly can, i.e. give it away. Give them access to it, make it easy to get to it, no barriers. Once they've got to it, once they start engaging with 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 it and with you then you need to put your thinking hat on of how you monetize that engagement but first and foremost you need to give people access and a lot of musicians still can't stomach that they still can't stomach the fact that you give their music away for nothing 
So that, that, I guess, takes us back to what you were mentioning then earlier about the kind of digital streaming world. Yeah. And, you know, the like, say, well, Amazon's got a streaming service. Obviously, Spot, Spotify's there as well. What do you think about that? I mean, it, you're giving it away for nothing. Well, well, for, for maybe not for nothing, but for not a lot. Mm-hmm. Are, are you happy with that? Or, or does it cause you anxiety from time to time? Uh, I'm completely happy with it. Uh, when you're making the music, it causes you anxiety. I mean, ah, right. when you're creating the stuff, and you're thinking, right, I'm working 14 hour days here. I've not seen my kid. I'm working Saturdays, I'm working Sundays just to meet these deadlines, just to get this thing finished. And you're thinking, for what? To give it away? Some, when you're in that, actually in the midst of the creative process, that raises its ugly head to me. But once that's said and done, no, I'm absolutely fine. I mean, I don't know if you've got um, an Amazon Echo or an Amazon Dot. This, there's some stats out the last two or three weeks where Amazon has now overtaken iTunes and Spotify for streaming and it's because of the it's because of Alexa right. it's because of Alexa Alexa can you play Rod Stewart stay with me in the morning it starts <laughs> do you know what I mean it's like who, I mean why 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 would you even buy another CD or buy another record it was my, my partner Yvonne she was like after me to buy her a vinyl turntable and we were going to get this whole vinyl thing and she like, build me shelves and blah blah I'm thinking God, I'm vinyl, I'm not going to get vinyl again. So I bought an Amazon dot and I stuck it, <laughs> stuck it in the house and I said, watch this everyone, Alexa, play Fionn Reagan. And it started playing Fionn Reagan through the speakers. She's like, what's that? I said, that's your record collection. You've now got the biggest record collection in the world. Yeah. And uh, if you buy an Amazon dot or an Amazon Echo, you can get Amazon Unlimited Music for three ninety nine a month. Right. Well, that's, I mean, that's a bargain. It's like you say. And, and we see the same with Amazon on the retail side. Yeah. The growth of Amazon is scary. Yeah, um, they're, now they're, now they're, they're now the largest music streaming entity. Forget iTunes, forget Spotify. Just because of this dot. I mean, that's, uh, I mean I've mean, i got friends that work in IT who, uh, I, think they won't, I won't mention the names in case that I shouldn't be talking about this, but they're, they're working with banks. Now, the whole thing about the Alexa and the Amazon dot is um, my, my mother's of a certain age, all she worries about is music. Sorry, all she worries about is money and all she worries about is listening to Radio 4. So she listens, shouts at Radio 4 during the day and is always worrying about how much money she's got in the bank. Now he's, sh- this is my friend that's designed this uh, app for Alexa. Um, you can log into your bank account by voice and Alexa will talk you through what's in your bank account, how much money you've spent this week, how much money you spent last month, how much money you should maybe hold back for stuff that's coming up. Oh, it, was, it was amazing, Alex. That sounds and like what, a very depressing conversation to be having well, with. <laughs> but, it's a, it, but you know old people, all they do is worry about money. Yeah. So it's the whole silver surfers, get, get them one of these Amazon dots, log it into the bank account, and you can have, it's like having an automated financial advisor. Let's monitoring your bank accounts. It was amazing to watch. I thought this is so. I mean, the, the whole thing about Alexa and the Amazon dot, as far as music is concerned, I love it. To try and get it to play Hue and Cry was really annoying. I was like, Alexa, play Hue and Cry. Nothing. <laughs> I was like, Alexa. <laughs> so I mean, I need. I just keep asking for it so I can get us back up to the top of the search results and stuff like that. But uh, do you actually no, monitor the downloads you get on streaming, or do you not bother? Do you not look? I oh, know we do. It's always yeah. it's all monitored. Yep, um, you can easily do it. I think there's about thirty thousand, thirty five thousand a month on Spotify, which is kind of all right. It's not it's not through the roof, but it's all right. It's not enough. To, you don't earn from them, Alex. You only earn if you're in the millions, and yeah. it's even even now the tens of millions. If you've got a million streams, you're not earning a lot of money. Goodness. Um, even on YouTube and even on Spotify. No, I think YouTube at the moment in YouTube, I think it's about fifteen hundred quid for a million streams. Which is nothing. Yeah. So you need to be the tens of millions before you start making any money. Wow. You mentioned vinyl earlier on, um, before yeah. you got on Amazon Dot. I mean, vinyls came back to, to really, I guess, re-energise a lot of the kind of music industry. Any thoughts on why people are suddenly turning to vinyl again? Well, the demographic is, there's one demographic, it's 35 to 55 year olds, that's it. Well, right, that's back to vinyl. Yeah, well, that's us, yeah, that's both of us, and there's a lot of our friends as well. Uh, I've resisted it. Uh, a lot of my friends have got their beautiful turntables, and they're they've bought. They've actually made. There's actually plans out there for the old seventies, eighties record racks you used to get in the record stores. Those things that have got. They look a bit like you know the thin legs that go out at a slight angle. And yeah. It's like the kind of inclined slots. The classic. Oh, they're made of like. Um, well, I guess you made them from MDF now, but I don't know what it was made made from then. Hardboard probably. Um, yeah. 
and uh, I've seen plans for them, and people are building them, and they're basically turning part of the living room into like a record fair. <laughs> like, for God's sake! But I mean, if they're into it, they're into it. Uh, I, I don't, I don't subscribe to it. I must admit. I remember trying to learn um, piano solos and saxophone solos by literally slowing the record down to 17 RPM, playing it at about a fifth down, do, 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 and then trying to transpose it and speed it up. I know those were tortures. And everybody was in the same boat, you're a musician. There was no other way of trying to learn stuff other than playing it really slow in your record player. Um, so now you don't even need to do that. Uh, it, does it sound better? Do you know what it does? I yeah. think vinyl does sound better, but old vinyl sounds better. The new stuff, and they're just printing what they're printing, the mastered versions of the files on the CD. I don't, are they taking care to master them for vinyl? I guess maybe some of the bigger acts and some of the dance acts will be, but I mean, if you, if you master it too loud and then try and put it on vinyl, the needle will just jump out. So you need to do a completely different mastering technique dynamic-wise to make it sound good on vinyl, which is an added expense. And the other thing is, the Pocket Full of Stones album you've got coming out on the 1st of September, the reason it's been delayed so long is the lead time for vinyl is five months. Wow. So you give so them f- files. So it's, so it's coming out in all the different media formats as well then? It'll come out in all the different formats, but the lead time's five months for vinyl. It's crazy. There's just, it's like, really? There's just not enough places to make vinyl. So the thing was put back. I mean, I finished the record in, where's this? This is May, um, I think, the end of March. Aye, middle of March I finished the record. It's not going out till September because of vinyl leak times. So, aye. That's, that's quite surprising. <clears throat> uh, I guess it's maybe caught a lot of folks out that it's became so popular so quickly. Well, I think uh, there's, there's um, I think there was a new pressing plant in, in, in Britain about a month ago to All try right. and ease some of the, the kind of uh, stress uh, on the supply and the demand in the supply. But... Uh, yeah, and plus, it's a premium. It's like nineteen ninety nine. You're getting away for buying an album for nineteen ninety nine. Um, I've not been. I don't go any second. I pass an Oxfam Room Music Store and Buyers Road every day. I go to the studio. I should go in actually and see what the prices are. So I'm sure they must have a wee hit off it by putting their prices up. So like a second hand vinyl would now cost you over a tenner rather than two quid. Well, certainly we've got a couple of clients who sell vinyl. And it seems to have really re-energised their business because, it, great? you know, it's, it's much more, I mean, you know yourself, it's, it's something that's good to pick up. It's a bit like what you were talking about with your collector's package. Yeah, People I guess. to pick things up and, yeah. and sense that they've got something pretty tangible here. Yeah, that's um, the thing. People like to give uh, the gift as a something as tactile gift that you can unwrap right. and you can, you know, as you say, you can you can uh, you can physically re- interact with it. Yeah, I think uh, that I think that's got a lot to do with it, Alex. I think you're right. But me personally, no, I've kind of moved on. I like mamas and dot. <laughs> <laughs> I can just see you dancing around the floor and shouting, <laughs> hue and cry, <laughs> hue and cry. <laughs> it was uh, my my daughter's only four and a half, so I was at uh, induction day at school last week, and usually you iron up all the other parents and all the other kids. And this poor wee lassie, her mother called her Alexa. I couldn't believe it. Oh, Alexa, shit. Alexa! And Eva Rose, my daughter's looking at me, going, "Dad, is Alexa here?" No, 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 that's not Alexa. <laughs> <laughs> so this poor wee lassie's going to be shouting at the rest of her life, going, "Alexa, what time is it? Alexa, what's the weather like tomorrow?" Oh, <laughs> anyway. And a busy time coming up for you. I mean, you've got the album coming out for September and yep. it's festival season as well. How do you balance all that with a, with a young family? Um, you just, you know, it's like you take each week as it comes. So um, we're fortunate enough that we've still got one set of grandparents that are able. But you realise who your real friends are. They kind of come out and say, look, I can take her and do this. I can do this. I can do this. So... It's like every other parent. You've just you just sort of wait till you're confronted with something and you learn how to deal with it. You, you can prepare as best you can, but um, no, I'm Pat's kids are grown up, so he had his kids young, uh, and it was frustrating for me because he wouldn't do as much as we probably should have because he had two young kids to raise. Yeah. Now his kids are in their mid twenties and early twenties, and my kids four and a half, so it's it's like history repeating itself, but. Um, no, as I say, as the famous phrase, it takes a village to raise a child. We've got, we've <laughs> and got you've us. got you've got open live coming up. Will you take take your kid along to that? Will you take the family to that? 
it's difficult to take children to these things because I was talking to another musician about it and his kid goes everywhere. She's roughly the same age as Eva Rose. And I said, well, how do you organise the babysitter? She says, well, you just get to the venue and you find some other bands that have got kids with them and you say, I'll look after you as you look after mine. I'm like, right. really? Is that what you do? And I said, I can do that. And there's quite, we did the Hogman A show on BBC last uh, uh, Hogman A and I wanted to bring Eva Rose, four years old kid, just to see it. And we were told by the BBC, no, if she does come, she has to stay in the dressing room. She can't be anywhere near the stage. Like, uh, There is self- health and safety issues of children that young anywhere near a stage. Uh, I'm going to wait till she's a wee bit older, Alex. I'll wait till maybe she's like, you know, 10, 11, and she can come and hang out. But at the moment, she's just a wee bit too young to come anywhere near. There is a lot of health and safety issues at gigs. We do, you just don't think about it, but... You know, a four and a half year old on a stage would just be. I'm just thinking all the things she could trip over and stick her finger into, and oh no. I well, I'm disappointed about that. I'm disappointed because I've also seen on your website on hueandcry.com <clears> that <throat> you're going to be gigging at Pizza Expresses, and I just figured that she might enjoy a bit of pizza for time to time <laughs> when, when her dad's playing on the stage. I say, Daddy, Daddy, more chips. Uh, no. Well, Pizza Express have got a long lineage of jazz, um, supporting jazz. And the Pizza Express Jazz Gig in London has been one of the most iconic jazz venues to play in the world, Pizza Express. So they're just rolling this out. Because the London one's been so successful over the last 15, 20 years, um, I can't remember how many we're doing. There's about four or five Pizza Expresses that we're doing. Um, I should know that, actually, what month we're doing it. But it's just they're trying to take this whole um, love of jazz and a venue that's great for jazz um, all around the country and see how it goes. So they've asked us to get involved. There's lots of other jazz musicians getting involved. So we're chuffed to bits. Alex, I wish them well. I'll try my best for them because, um, you know, we're big lovers of jazz music and jazz and pizza sounds like a good night out to me. <laughs> no, it sounds like a good idea. I like the idea of it being a relatively intimate yeah. uh, kind of place to listen to stuff. But they um, always put really good pianos in. Like they spend a fortune on the pianos. Right, and I guess you like your pianos. Well, the thing is, like, jazz musicians and um, the venues, it's not the size of the, the the stage or the height of the, the ceiling, it's how good the piano is. So it could be the crappiest little hellhole, but the piano's amazing. So there was Henry's Bar in Edinburgh, I remember the piano was just brilliant, and it was the roughest, meanest, toughest little bar, <laughs> but the jazz musicians loved going there just for the piano. So it's the piano that's the draw, for the musicians to come and play. So Peace Express, I don't know who the, who the guy that's involved in it, but he knows he's good piano, so there's always a good piano there. Well, there you go. I mean, mm. I didn't realise that Peace Express were, were so musical or oh, so yeah. jazz inclined. Peace, if you stick Peace Express London and jazz into Google, you'll see the whole history of it. It's a huge, it's been on for 15, 20 years. Fascinating. All right. Mm. Greg, look, thanks for your time today. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. And uh, But before I let you go, Mm-hmm. Um, I've got some quick fire questions for you and, and I must then. warn you that I can only take your first answer. So are you okay. ready? I'm ready. Okay. Tom Jones or Shirley Bassey? Tom Jones. Average white band or the associates? Average white band. The Browns or Urwilly? Urwilly. Fish and chips or sushi? Sushi. Down the gym or out for a country walk? Country walk. Buchanan Street or Princess Street? Buchanan Street. <laughs> <laughs> that last one was easy. Well done, Greg. You scored six out of six. Okay, I'm <laughs> I didn't know I was being. I didn't know I was being marked there. Okay. You will go into the the the, uh, the lottery to see who wins the big prize at the end of this series. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Alex. I've really enjoyed it. And um, just any time you need me again, give me a shout. Well, do look the best of luck with the gigs coming up with the Pocket Full of Stones album, first uh, of September. You said. Yep. Um, and available for pre-order on hueandcry.com. I think hueandcry.co.uk. Oh, hueandcry.co.uk, forgive me. Hueandcry.com is a fire service in America. Really? We've, tr- we've tried so many times to get that uh, URL, but we've gone with hueandcry.co.uk. Unless you're having problems with fires, then it's hueandcry.com if you're in America. <laughs> All right, thanks again for joining us on the Marketplace Sellers podcast. Cheers, Alex. Uh, And thanks to you, the listener. Remember to share, like, follow and subscribe and five stars on iTunes, not 15, but five. Uh, That would make us feel so much more loved and appreciated. Uh, And to tell us what you want to find out about, just drop us a line at podcast at sellerdynamics.com and we'll see what we can do. Bye for now.